Each their own, right? Each their own, right? <laughs> their own. right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm I'm ready for the for the flowers and the buds on the trees and the leaves and everything. So, yeah. yep. That's Flower. that's that's a that's and, and and but I but I have seen some robins already here. So the robins well, are good. coming back. That's good. That is a good sign. Yeah, definitely. Very good sign. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we had what was it a few months ago? We saw some Arctic geese flying around our. Uh, our ship, the, the Brig Niagara. And uh, so, you know, different types of birds that we don't normally see um, right in our right. area. So it's, it's, it's nice to see wildlife starting to come back too. So. They're, right. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Good. That's uh, that's a sign, sure sign of spring. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we uh, starting to get some attendees. So, you know, they usually come right after the two o'clock mark on Saturdays, which is oh, fine. Yeah. No problem. So, yeah. No, when, when you when you tell me go, that's when I'll I'll start it up and everything like that. Perfect. So. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Now, if I remember correctly, um, you graduated from Northwestern Illinois. Is that correct? No, North Northeastern. Northeastern. I'm, I'm not that okay. prestigious. Okay. Northeastern I, I was... is a. <laughs> Northeastern <laughs> I wasn't is... sure. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, Northeastern is a state school. And I could afford that. I couldn't afford going to Northwestern. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, I feel and, you. And North, <laughs> Northeastern doesn't have a, a, a football team. It didn't have anything. So. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I graduated from a state school too. It's, it's yeah. fine. Yep. It's fine. <laughs> well, what's, what's, what's interesting is uh, for a while there, we had a president of the university that wanted to get a name for our university. And he entered us into the like NCAA college uh, mm -hmm. basketball tournament yeah. that we were just so, we were so bad that Northeastern holds the record for the, the biggest differential between, you know, the high score and, the, you know, they only scored like, like 30 points the whole game. Oh, and the man. other guy scored like 108. Oh. I mean, it, you know, so, so after a couple That's of years, sad. they decided mm, we're out of our league, people. <laughs> they dropped out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sometimes you just have to admit defeat. Know. I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Oh, it was. Man. And then, but we did have a guy that led the league with steel. Now, um, I was at the time that they brought in the uh, the basketball team. Because I also worked at the university as a later on after I graduated, I worked as a uh, university police officer. Yeah. And um, I was there when they had this basketball tournament or not tournament, but you know the the NCAA. And and I took and I um, I would work the games. You know, you have to have an officer present yeah. to sort of protect the referees <clears throat> more than anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a guy that led the league on steals. He was a, a little guy, really fast, and he would, you know, swat the ball away and steal it. Yeah. Well, about, <clears throat> about a year later, we ended up arresting him for stealing. <laughs> so, oh. so he, well, he hey, wasn't I only – right. <laughs> right. He wasn't only a good thief on the ball court, but he ended up – well, he was a bad thief because he got caught. But it, 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 it yeah. is pretty ironic. So. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. Oh well. That's funny. <laughs> it is. Uh, it's it not. Is, it yeah. is, but it is not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's sad. It's sad, but it makes you laugh. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You gotta laugh. The, the, gotta the, laugh. the, the uh, irony of it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, I start, I'm seeing some people trickling in. Hello, everybody. We, uh, we will get started okay. here in another minute or two. Um, let yeah. people trickle in a little, a little bit more. Um, but uh, if you're here, welcome. Now they can all they can all see my screen, correct? Uh, I they should. I can see it. If uh, can everyone okay. see that in the chat? Just give me a uh, thumbs up or a yes or whatever. There we go. Yeah, we're starting to see. Okay. Thanks. Good deal. Good deal. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm seeing some some familiar names, but it's nice to see some new names. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's good. That's good. <clears throat> okay. And like I said, we'll get started in just a few minutes, guys, uh, or just another minute or two, actually. Um, I'm excited for this one, not going to lie. Good, 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 <laughs> good. Yeah, and, and well, I'm excited to bring it, and I'm always glad to educate people about the, you know, the greatest maritime disaster in American history. Right. So. And, and ironically, not many people know it. And uh, No. Yeah, no, so. No. <laughs> 
And and so. I'll again I'll <laughs> I'll mention that I'll mention why it was it was so overshadowed and yeah. so soon forgotten. But yeah. Uh, a part of my present, I don't want to give it away. Don't want to give it away. <laughs> yeah, no spoilers. No spoilers. All right. Don't spoil it. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yep. Greetings from Venezuela. Holy cow! Hello. Wow. That is awesome. I think you might be the furthest uh, participant uh, that we've had ever. Wow. So, Very cool. Welcome. Welcome. That is incredible. Thank you so much for for tuning in. Um, I will, uh, we'll get started. Um, if people tune in um, and, and hop on later on, um, this video, it, this is being recorded, so uh, people will be able to watch it. Um, but uh, welcome, welcome. Um, just a couple ground rules before we get started. Number one, just be respectful in the chat uh, to our fellow guests, to our presenter, um, as well as little old me. Uh, but I trust you guys will be just fine. Um, this is being recorded. Uh, don't fret, only myself and uh, Jean are going to be uh, on camera. Um, your your camera and uh, microphones are disabled for this presentation as this is a webinar platform. If you have to leave early, um, don't worry about that. Uh, like I said, we understand uh, life happens. Uh, questions will be taken after the presentation. Um, we've allotted 15 minutes for Q&A. All of that from the moment right now to the very end is going to be recorded, uh, uploaded onto our Facebook page, eriemaritimemuseum.org, as well as our uh, YouTube, which same name, uh, easy to find. Um, <clears throat> for those who don't know, my name is Charles Johnson. I am the museum educator at the Erie Maritime Museum in Erie, Pennsylvania. Erie Maritime Museum is administered by the PA Historical and Museum Commission out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And we are home to the official flagship of the Commonwealth of PA, the US Brig Niagara. Um, our mission, we are a community gathering place, welcoming audiences of all abilities and backgrounds to encounter and experience the maritime history and heritage of the greater Erie region, including civilian activity in innovation, military service, and Pennsylvania's contributions to the maritime industry and stewardship of the Great Lakes. Um, this afternoon, we return to our lecture series called Boats, Ships, and Us. This is where we pick a boat or a uh, watercraft, and uh, we tell about how that vessel um, shaped the human experience. And we're connecting with maritime and military museums, as well as special guests um, in the field. Um, and today's topic really does fit into this concept very well. Um, and I am thrilled. I was telling uh, Jean before, um, uh, thrilled to be welcoming our uh, special guest today because uh, when I was a kid, I picked up my first ever Civil War book that I ever bought myself, Disaster on the Mississippi, and uh, by by our um, by our presenter today. So this is exciting for me, um, and I hope that you are all excited as well. Um, Mr. Salaker is uh, from the great state of Illinois. Um, he's a graduate of Northeastern. <laughs> Illinois University and has written several articles and books on this very topic. Um, he's also a well-known collector of artifacts and photographs of this very tragedy. So without further ado, I am thrilled to officially welcome Gene Salaker. Gene, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate it. And welcome everybody to this uh, lecture series. Uh, and I am talking today about disaster on the Mississippi the uh, loss of the, uh, the explosion burning of the steamboat Sultana at the very end of the Civil War. Now the Sultana, uh, and uh, this is maybe not a very clear photograph of the Sultana, but uh, this is actually a photograph of a, uh, a mural of uh, several photographs of the St. Louis waterfront. And uh, uh, nobody knew that this was our Sultana because there were actually five boats called Sultana. Um, ours is gonna be the last one, I guess after the disaster, they figured we better not name any other boat Sultana. Uh, but this, this was, uh, uh, we noticed that this boat was in this picture and this is a blow up of it. So there are actually two photographs of the Sultana, this one of her docked at St. Louis and the one I will show you in just a little while. Uh, the Sultana was actually built in, Saint, uh, in uh, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, in February of 1863. It was built by a man named Preston Lodwick, and he designed his boat for the eventual cotton trade from St. Louis down to New Orleans. Now, being built in February 1863, the Mississippi is still being controlled by the Confederacy. The Confederates are still holding out at Port Hudson and at, of course, Vicksburg, Mississippi. But Captain Lodwick knew that eventually Vicksburg is going to fall and the river is gonna open and then he can use the Sultana uh, for um, uh, 
uh, carrying cotton back and forth uh, down the river. And I'm gonna try to turn my pointer on here, my laser pointer. Um, hopefully you can see this, hopefully it gets recorded. You can notice that here he has an extra wide deck outside of the railings and stuff. He did that because you can take and you can stack cotton bales along this, as well as on this upper deck called the hurricane deck, as high up as the pilot house windows. You don't want to block the windows, but you can pile your cotton all the way up here. Um, also, because he designed this as a, a cotton packet, he had extra tall smokestacks or chimneys. They used to call them chimneys built onto his steamboat. And that was be so that uh, a, a spark did not fly out and land on the cotton and, and catch the cotton on fire. So he had the, the smokestacks built extra tall. Um, the, the Sultana was designed perfectly for carrying a large amount of cotton, later on, a large amount of human beings. The Sultana will actually uh, start up river uh, on its first maiden voyage on the Ohio River, heading towards Wheeling, West Virginia. But because these, uh, these smokestacks are so tall, it cannot get under, excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry, my telephone. <laughs> I'm gonna go back. Um, what happened is uh, he, he could not get under the uh, railroad bridge at Wheeling, West Virginia because the smokestacks were so tall. Well, they will offload whatever uh, um, supplies they had. I'm sorry, they were heading for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I got all thrown off with that telephone, I'm sorry. And uh, they stopped at Wheeling, West Virginia. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Charles. Call me back. Okay. Um, so so uh, they will eventually, Captain Lodwick will eventually head down river and start um, a, uh, working his boat from St. Louis to New Orleans, or to New Orleans, once Vicksburg takes and is... Okay, that should end that. I took the phone off the hook. The Sultan, I, I'm really apologize everybody on this. I have no control over my telephone. Um, what happens is that um, Preston Lodwick will run the, Sult the Sultana up and down the river once Vicksburg falls. And he makes a pretty good profit on it. And then in about uh, February of 1864, about a year later, he decides to sell his boat to a conglomerate of people from, uh, um, from um, St. Louis. And one of them is going to be Captain James Cass Mason, 34 years old. He is a um, what, what you would call a lead foot. He likes to take and race his boats. He had actually been a steamboat captain who had competed in a steamboat race against the Sultana, and he beat it. However, he, he does realize that with the proper captain and the proper crew, the Sultana could be the fastest boat on the river. So when the opportunity comes to buy into it, he does. He buys a quarter share of the Sultana. The only problem is uh, once Vicksburg is open, all the steamboats on the river are now rushing down to the south to pick up cotton, to, to uh, get goods that are arriving from the, the Eastern seaboard at New Orleans. And there is just too many uh, boats on the river and they're not making a lot of profit. James Cass Mason has run his, his uh, boat up and down. He's damaged the engines by speeding. Uh, he's hit a couple of snags and popped some holes in the hull of the Sultana, which have been repaired. All this is costing him money. He's not making a lot, so he's hurting for money. Uh, on uh, April 14, 1865, the Sultana will start down river from St. Louis and they are docked at Cairo, Illinois, when word uh, on the morning of April 15th, word is flashed that Abraham Lincoln has been assassinated in, uh, uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, James Cass Mason knows that if he can leave Cairo and rush down river with the, with the first news of Lincoln's assassination, he can make a name for himself and make the Sultana a famous boat. What he does is he grabs a number of newspapers from um, uh, the Cairo uh, newspapers, and he rushes down river knowing that there is no uh, telegraphic communication with the South because all of these lines have been cut during the war and everything. And as he goes down river, he's spreading the word that the uh, 
that Abraham Lincoln and Secretary of State Seward have been assassinated. Of course, we know later on that Seward was not killed. His throat was cut by one of the assassins, but he was not killed. The Sultana will deck itself out with black bunting. They will lower the flag to half staff, and he starts off down river on this uh, as a messenger of death, going down from uh, Cairo, Illinois, all the way down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. When he gets to uh, Vicksburg, the boat will stop. Uh, runners will bring those newspapers into the city to tell the Union officers in charge. But as the Sultana is stopping there, uh, a man named Captain Reuben Benton Hatch, the chief quartermaster at uh, Vicksburg, will come aboard the Sultana, and he has information that uh, James Cass Mason might be interested in. Uh, this is a uh, picture of, a, of the parole camp, which was being set up just outside of Vicksburg. Four miles outside of Vicksburg, there is a parole camp for prisoners that are union prisoners that are being released from Andersonville and from Cahaba prison, Andersonville in Georgia, uh, Cahaba prison near Selma, Alabama. These Northern prisoners are being sent towards Vicksburg where they are to await uh, an exchange. They are waiting there until Southern prisoners that are being held up in the North uh, can be sent down and then there will be a man for man, one for one exchange, a private for a private, a Lieutenant for a Lieutenant, captain for a captain. Um, this camp is set up four miles outside of Vicksburg, and uh, it will be, uh, even though these guys are still going to be Confederate prisoners, they will be clothed, they will be fed, they will be taken care of, medical necessities, all by the Union government. The guy that is in charge of uh, uh, providing tents, providing food, is the chief quartermaster, a man named uh, Captain Reuben Hatch. And here is his picture. We never knew that this man right here uh, was Hatch until just recently. Uh, Reuben Hatch is one of the most unscrupulous people in the entire Civil War. Um, he, he had gotten arrested a number of times uh, for using the quartermaster department to uh, raise funds for himself. He would buy things for the government at a certain price, but charge the government an additional fund and keep the extra money for himself. He gets arrested for this a number of times. However, he is a personal friend of Abraham Lincoln. His brother is, uh, again, another personal friend of Abraham Lincoln and the Secretary of State of Illinois. So anytime that Reuben Hatch got in trouble, he contacted his brother, who then contacted Lincoln, and he contacted Lincoln, and all his friends contact Lincoln, and he, is, he never sent, spends a single day in a court-martial trial. So he is in charge here at Vicksburg, in charge of, of, of these guys. Now, what do they look like? Well, they came from Andersonville, again, in Georgia, and Cahaba Prison in Selma, Alabama. This is a picture of a typical guy that came out of Andersonville. This is Eponidas W. McIntosh, the 14th Illinois Infantry. This is a drawing of what he looked like when he was released from Andersonville. Notice these marks on his arm. These are scurvy sores from not having enough vitamin C. He's got a crutch on his arm, under his arm and he's being held up. Um, he actually uh, uh, went into Andersonville in October of 1864, weighing 165 pounds. He ended up coming out uh, of just around 90 pounds. So he lost uh, almost 75 pounds while he was in prison. Uh, now, these are the men that are typically coming from Andersonville, much worse than the guys that were coming from Cahaba. This is a picture of John Henry King of the 9th Indiana Cavalry who had spent time in Cahaba. Notice this is a before and after picture. The before picture on the left shows him uh, what he looked like uh, uh, some, sometime before his capture. And then this, uh, the one on the left is showing, or on the right is showing him after he was released. He had this picture taken of himself at Vicksburg. You can see his cheeks now are so shallow, his, uh, his uniform uh, uh, his, does not fit on his chest the way this one was. Um, so he's in pretty bad shape, but not as bad as the men that were being released from Andersonville prison. These men will be sitting there waiting and the government is waiting for, these, for the Confederate soldiers to be brought back down from the North but it never happens. In the meantime, 
the South basically falls apart. And the South finally says, you know, rather than wait for these guys to be released man for man, exchange one for one, why don't you just start sending them home? Well, the government is going to pay the captains of these steamboats to carry officers $8 per man and per every uh, enlisted man, they'll give you $2.75. It actually depends on how many miles you're going. So from Vicksburg up to Cairo, Illinois, it'd be $8 per officer, $2.75 per enlisted man. Reuben Hatch knows this. Reuben Hatch meets with, with James Cass Mason, the captain of the Sultana, and says, I have a deal for, for you. I will guarantee you at least 1,000 men if you guarantee to give me a kickback. So Reuben Hatch is, again, looking to make money off the misery of these poor young men. And, and James Cass Mason, who's hurting for money, who actually owned a one-quarter share of the Sultana, but had sold half of that to his clerk, so he then owned only a one-eighth share, still hurting for money, he cuts his share in half again and ends up with a 1 16th minority share in the Sultana. He's looking for money and he says, sure, if you can guarantee me a thousand men when I come back up river, I'll make sure that you get a percentage of it. So the Sultana will head down river and while it's going down river to, to New Orleans to complete its, its journey, uh, the Henry Ames, a steamboat, comes up river and will take the first group of men that are being released from this uh, parole camp four miles outside of Vicksburg. Put on board the Henry Ames are 1,315 men from Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. So what they would have called the Western states at that time. Uh, they were supposed to be released in lots of only 1,000. However, there are 1,300 placed aboard the Henry Ames. The general in charge, a man named General Dana, does not quibble about it. He says, okay, as long as they're going home. The next steep moat to come along was the Olive Branch. And the Olive Branch will take 619 men from the eastern states, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. Um, the reason they only get 619 men is because the officers in charge of the parole camp are having trouble with the books that they got from the Confederate prisons. The books from Andersonville and the books from Cahaba have the men all jumbled in there. Whenever somebody was captured and arrived at the camp, their name was put in this book. They were not put in there by, by state. So you might have a, a Virginia guy uh, and a, a Michigan guy and an Iowa guy and a Pennsylvania guy and a New York guy, all next to each other. So what they're trying to do at this camp is sort through them and pull out all the Michigan, all the Ohio, all the Indiana, all the Missouri, but it's taking a long time. So when the Olive Branch arrives, there's only 619 men ready to be sent on board her. Now the Sultana is coming back up river after going all the way down river to New Orleans. And on April 23rd, 1865, they're about a hundred miles below Memphis or sorry, below Vicksburg, when one of the boilers suddenly springs a leak. Uh, the engineers in charge will lower the pressure in those boilers because there are four boilers. They're all interconnected. So he's got to reduce the pressure in all four so that it doesn't leak so bad or doesn't rupture. And they will limp into uh, Memphis on the night of April 23rd, late on the night of April 23rd. While the engineer rushes into town to try to find a boiler mechanic that can fix this leak, uh, James Cass Mason goes into town to, to see Captain Hatch and see if he can get his 1,000 men. The problem is, is that um, uh, when, the, when the boiler mechanic shows up, he finds out that there's a rupture, a bulge in these plates, about, about in this area here, if you can see where my, my pointer is, and um, uh, what he wants to do is he wants to cut out the, the ruptured or the bulged plates. That uh, uh, It would probably take about two or three days to do this. Well, the chief engineer, a man named Nathan Wintrinker says, no, I can't allow you to do that. We're expecting a group of paroled prisoners to take up to St. Louis. Can you just pound the bulge back in, rivet a plate over it, and we'll have it changed in St. Louis? Well, against his better judgment, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, boiler mechanic says, okay, I'll do it. This is what a steamboat boiler 
uh, and furnace would have looked like. Here's your furnace right here. This is where the coal would have been out here and they would have tossed it through these gratings into uh, uh, sort of like the same type of a top that you have on your grill, your barbecue grill. Uh, the coal would sit here as it burns, it gets hot, the ash falls down into an ash pan, which is down here. The heat will take and, and go underneath the boiler. This is your boiler right here, this light blue spot. The heat will go underneath your boiler, go up through some tubes or flues all the way to the smokestacks and then up the smokestack. And it does that by a draft, the same way your chimney works in your, in your home, in your house. Um, as this hot air is going through these tubes or flues, it is heating up the water that is around them. And as the water boils, the steam from the, the boiling water uh, uh, collects in a steam drum and then goes through these uh, tubes and stuff to where the steamboat engines are. And that is what drives your, your steamboat. Now, later on, you're going to hear mention about a possible sabotage. Was the Sultana sabotage? No, people, it was not. Some people claim that there was a coal torpedo, uh, which is a lump of coal that had been, or it was actually a, 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 a bomb made to look like a lump of coal. And it had about four ounces of gunpowder in it. it. They did exist. There was such a thing. But um, people claim that this, this coal torpedo was thrown into the, into the furnace. And when it finally burned through, it exploded. Well, I've got news for you. The explosion will happen back here from the back end of the boilers. So it was not a coal uh, bomb that blew up underneath the boilers. It was the defective boilers themselves that could not stand the pressure and eventually blew out through the back. I want to dispel that right now. Um, as the Sultana is sitting there before any people are brought on board, the, a steamboat called the Lady Gay will arrive. It's a newer steamboat, it's only about a year old, and it's a larger steamboat. And they also want some men uh, placed on board. But Reuben Hatch has this you know, exclusive uh, uh, contract, so to speak, secret contract with James Cass Mason to put uh, a thousand men or as many people as he can on board the Sultana. Uh, the other officers involved with the, with the loading of the uh, steamboats, they discovered that there is a rumor of a bribe going out there, but they think that is the lady gay that offers that bribe. So they will say, we are not going to put anybody on the lady gay, every man out of that parole camp, and they think there's only 1,400, is going on the Sultana. So the lady gay will leave Memphis before any men start going on board the Sultana without a single paroled prisoner. Now the Sultana is sitting at the dock and uh, all throughout the date of April 24th, there are three train loads of paroled prisoners sent from the parole camp out to the Sultana. The men come from Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, Tennessee, and a sprinkling of men from West Virginia. These are all headed to Cairo, Illinois. James Cass Mason is gonna get $8 per officer and there's 35 officers and the rest are enlisted men and he will get $2.75 per man to put on his boat. He doesn't know how many are going on there, but after a while they can see that it's a lot more than just a thousand. It may be 1,300, it may be 1,400, which is what the officers at the parole camp think there are. But what happens is, uh, as they are being loaded on board the boat, even the, the men being put on board realize this is getting more crowded than, than we ever thought. And an officer in charge, William H. Fiddler of the 6th Kentucky Cavalry, who is the ranking officer among the prisoners, says, wait a minute, I'm stopping this third train. We're not going on this boat because because there is another steamboat that has arrived called the Pauline Carroll. And he says, why can't this last train go on board the Pauline Carroll? Well, the officers that are loading the Sultana say, you don't want to go on the Pauline Carroll. They have smallpox on board. Well, in these guys weakened condition from being in prison camps, they decided, eh, we better not take a chance catching smallpox and our weakened condition it will kill us we might as well all go on board the Sultana. By the time the Sultana is ready to leave on the night of April 24th, 
it will have 300,000 pounds of sugar placed in its hold in these big old barrels called hogshead barrels. Now that turns out to be a blessing in disguise because it acts as a ballast for all these guys on the upper decks. There is almost 100 government horses and mules that are being carried up river also to St. Louis. There are 70 paying civilian passengers, people that probably bought a ticket to go on the Sultana before they realized that, that over a thousand men are gonna be crowded on board. So they're sort of stuck there. You have a crew of 85 men and women. You have 22 guards placed on board from the 58th Ohio Infantry to make sure there's no fights, to make sure that there's no uh, uh, problem with the, the uh, you know, uh, the giving out of the food and stuff like that. And it turns out there was 1,959 re recently released Union prisoners of war. Not 1,000, not 1,300, not 1,400, but almost 2,000 recently released Union prisoners. So you had a total of 2,136 people on a boat that was legally registered to carry only 360, uh, 76 passengers and a crew of 85. Talk about being overloaded and overcrowded. And don't let me forget, the Sultana also had a pet alligator on board. The pet alligator was kept in a nice little sturdy wooden box. It was the, the mascot or the pet of the crew. And when the soldiers saw it, they some of them had never been that close to a live alligator before. So they were poking sticks at it and watching the alligator snap at the snicks and hiss and everything like that. So the crew felt sorry for their, their pet. And they took and they dragged this sturdy wooden box with the creature inside of it underneath the main, uh, main stairway and closed the closet door there. So it's kept underneath a closet under the main stairway. And we will hear about the alligator in a little bit. Now the Sultana will start up river on the night of April 24th at Lee's Vicksburg, and it is going up river against one of the worst floods in uh, modern day history. Uh, at some points, uh, the river was three miles wide. And the reason is because the levees and the dikes have all sort of disappeared or, or uh, worn through. And usually they are maintained by the Army Corps of Engineers. But during the war, the Army Corps of Engineers did not have time to work on the Mississippi River. They were the ones that were building the corduroy or the wooden roads. They were the ones building the fortifications around Petersburg uh, and in different places. So they did not have time to work on the Mississippi. So the Sultana will start up river and it goes at its normal rate of about nine or 10 miles per hour. Um, People have, have wondered, you know, if you're going against a strong flood current and you're maintaining your, your average speed, chances are those engineers were pushing those boilers a lot harder than what they, what they uh, admitted to later on. Um, the Sultana, it's, it's like, you, you know, driving your car up a hill. If you're going to maintain an average speed going up that hill, you're going to have to give it more gas. And that's what was probably happening here. They were probably running the Sultana at a higher boiler pressure than they should have in order to maintain an average speed on this flooded Mississippi River. Well, the Sultana will eventually dock on the morning of April 26 at Helena, Arkansas, where a photographer named Thomas W. Banks takes this famous photograph of the Sultana. Now, uh, he, he was there, he, saw, he lived in, in Helena, he saw this incredible sight. He turned his camera, took this image. And uh, this is, was thought of as the only known photograph of the Sultana, but I showed you one earlier of the Sultana docked at St. Louis. Um, why are, are uh, Thomas W. Banks was set up there with his camera because he was taking pictures of the town of Helena itself. The river, this is the river back here, the Mississippi River, the river has overflowed its banks so much that the town of Helena was inundated by the waters. In fact, Union soldiers were going through the streets on boats. They were carrying, you know, caisson wagons and they were carrying their men on boats. So when these, when the Sultana pulled up, all these guys were, were busy looking at that. And uh, Thomas W. Banks will turn his picture and take this famous, famous photo. 
Now I have studied this photo for many, many years and I have noticed some things. First, over here is a head of a horse. They, remember I said there was about 75 to 100 horses on board. They were kept along this back uh, area on both sides. Uh, here are some horses heads also. So here is an actual photograph showing this is where the horses were. You'll also notice here is some clothing hanging on a line. These guys have, uh, their clothing has gotten wet from a, a couple of little rain showers and they've taken off their shirts and they've hung them on a line to dry out. You'll also notice right here is elk's antlers. Uh, the fastest steamboat on a river was awarded the coveted elk's antlers, which they could then put between the bracings on their, on the, uh, between the smokestacks. The Sultana and James Cass Mason, I said he liked the racist boat. He had set the record for the fastest time from New Orleans to St. Louis on the trip just prior to this uh, famous uh, disaster trip. Uh, and because he had set a record of four days and seven hours coming from New Orleans up to Memphis, he was awarded the coveted elk antlers, which he quickly placed between his, uh, uh, his uh, chimneys. Now, why would you want this? Well, if you're a, a, a passenger and you want the fastest boat, or you're a freight agent and you wanna send your freight on the fastest boat, and you have several boats docked at a landing, all you gotta do is look up at the smokestacks and the one that has the elk antlers, that's the fastest boat, that's the one you want. And why is this fella here standing up so high as compared to these other fellas? Well, he's standing on top of the only lifeboat that the Sultana has. It is a metallic lifeboat that is flipped upside down so it doesn't fill with water and he is standing on top of it. There is a little boat over here. This is not a lifeboat though. This is called a yawl, a sounding yawl. When the river started to drop and get lower, they would send a couple of their crewmen out in front of the boat with a leaded line to drop over the side to see how deep the water is so that you didn't bottom out. Uh, during the disaster, what's going to happen is um, some men will take this, this metallic boat, throw it into the water. Uh, a lot of people jump in on top of it. There was a big fights for it until somebody from the top deck will jump into the water with it, uh, with a big board and actually puncture a hole in the bottom of it. And the lifeboat sinks and not a single person is saved. With this yawl, what happens is right after the boilers explode, Five crewmen are going to race to it and they're going to jump in, lower the boat and escape. In fact, they said that they could hear some of the, uh, the wives of these crewmen yelling for them to come back and save them. The men will go, they will be rescued at Memphis. They will be sent all the way up to St. Louis where they are eventually arrested to be sent back to Memphis to be put on trial. We don't know whatever happened in that trial. However, it, it never made the papers. This here, what are these streaks here? And why are these little holes here? This is where the guys are going to the bathroom. They, there were two bathrooms on a steamboat, one behind uh, one paddle wheel and one on the other side, one for men, one for women. Well, these guys up on the upper decks, if they have to come down stairways to go to this, this bathroom, they're never gonna make it, especially if they have dysentery or diarrhea. So they were using the fire buckets. Fire buckets are round bottom buckets um, that usually are in a stand. They've got a round bottom on them because you cannot use them as a regular bucket because if you put a round bottom bucket on the deck, it's going to fall over and spill the water. So they are specifically made for fire and they are stuck in some side racks. Well, these guys up on the upper deck had nowhere to go to the bathroom. So they took those fire buckets and they were using them to go to the bathroom in. When they got a chance, they would dump it over the side and that's what this streaking is right here. You don't wanna dump it over the side here because it might blow back into the people. Um, same thing here, you're blowing it down, it's gonna go down into these guys. So they would throw it over the side where the paddle wheels are. They also cut holes in the sides of the, of the paddle wheel so they could sit here and just go to the bathroom right down into the paddle wheel. Now, one thing we've noticed is that there's nobody in this section here. There's all these soldiers here. There's men on top and front and back down below, but there doesn't seem to be anybody here except for one person. And that is a lady right here 
called Lucy Ross. She was a paying passenger. And what we, what we have speculated is that this second deck, I'll go back a little bit, this area was off limits to the soldiers. Only the civilian passengers could stand or sit here so they could sit and watch the river go by and not be bothered by all these men. So this is the one picture of a civilian on board the Sultana. Now the Sultana, while it is docked, uh, after leaving Helena, it goes up river and it docks at Memphis, Tennessee. It arrived there at seven o'clock at, at, in the evening. While they are there, they will remove the, uh, those big hogsheads, 300,000 pounds of sugar from the hold of the Sultana. While the Sultana was going up river, whenever it would pass an interesting site or another boat going down river the opposite direction, the men would crowd to the side to wave at it, and yell insults or yell you know, uh, things to them. And the boat would tilt a little. Well, that was with 300,000 pounds of uh, ballast in the hold. Once that ballast is removed, you can imagine how top heavy the Sultana would be when it starts up river again. The Sultana will leave Memphis, it'll go up river and take on some coal. And then it starts following this dotted line here, uh, past an area called Patty's Hen and Chickens, which is the big hen island and the little chicken islands off to the side. It goes up to about here and right here, it's gonna cross over from one side of the, Sultan, or the, the Mississippi River to the other. That strong flood current is coming sideways and hitting the Sultana in the side. The Sultana has lost that ballast. What happens is they will take in on an even le level, you have to have water above, above these tubes or flues. But what happens when the Sultana is hit in the side, the uh, boat will tilt a little bit and now these tubes are above the water line because all four of these boilers are interconnected and the water from these, this upper boiler will flow into the lower boiler. Um, these tubes still have hot air traveling through them from the furnace and below them. So these tubes are now turning red hot. And as they get red hot, when the steamboat crosses the river, comes back to that even keel, what happens is uh, this, now the water touches those hot boiler plates or those hot tubes and you had an explosion on the Sultana at two o'clock in the morning on April 27, 1865. That extra, that water coming back and hitting those extra hot tubes increased the pressure. The steamboat boiler was not strong enough uh, to hold that ex ex increase in pressure and the back of the boilers will explode and, and rupture upward. Uh, as I said before, the explosion came from the back. It does not come from the front where a cold torpedo would have been thrown. And the, uh, the explosion will rip upward at about a 45 degree angle and completely tear the pilot house off of the Sultana. That was a problem. Normally when you had a fire on a boat or you had some type of a problem, the pilot was told to take his boat and ram it into the shore and let everybody run off and save themselves. The boat might burn, uh, but at least everybody was safe. Well, now that the pilot house is gone, there's nobody to steer the vessel and the Sultana is now a floating wreck. The two the smokestacks that were standing up, they were interconnected by those uh, bracings. They will start to twist and turn. Eventually the bracing in between breaks away and one, one, paddle, one uh, chimney will fall forward onto the forward part of the hurricane deck. And that was as crowded as could be. So it hits there, kills a bunch of people, but it crushed the hurricane deck down on top of the second deck where people were down underneath that also. Uh, so people are being crushed between the two decks. The, the uh, other uh, chimney will fall backwards into the hole that was blasted by the explosion. The wind and everything is coming from the front and blowing across the bow. Well, when this happens at two o'clock in the morning, there is a mass panic to get off the boat. And actually it was a steam explosion. It was not a fire explosion. But once all of this debris up here falls down into those open furnaces because there's no boilers anymore, three of the four boilers have blown up and disintegrated. The furnaces are now open all of this debris falls into it and it starts a fire. The fire could have been put out if they could have found the fire buckets 
and thrown buckets of water onto the fire. But none of the fire buckets are in the rack. They had been used by the guys for going to the bathroom or even for fishing water up to the upper deck so they could have something to drink. So there are no fire buckets when they are needed. Um, at first, there's a big mass rush off the bow. But when these guys on the bow suddenly figure out that, hey, the wind is blowing the flames towards the rear of the boat, we're safe. About 500 of them decide we're going to rename, uh, remain on board here and just see what happens. Well, the, the uh, one, the side paddle wheel will sort of canter away. It does not fall all the way down. Uh, it falls partially, but not all the way off. And as I said, the flames start to go towards the stern. And these guys on the bow suddenly fi figured out this is the safest place to be. Um, the guys on the back, however, as crowded as it was on the hurricane deck and the second deck and this main deck, they suddenly got to get off because the flames are eating towards them. And people that jumped off uh, first were being jumped upon by guys from the upper deck about 30 feet above them. One of the families that's going to be on board is the Annis family. Ann Annis, her husband, uh, retired Lieutenant Harvey Annis and their child Isabella. When the explosion occurs, Harvey Annis, and they're in a, in a private stateroom, he will put a life belt around himself and have a life belt around Anne, but Isabel is too small. So he takes Isabel or Belle, puts her on his back and they rush back to this area here and they will come out of these windows and lower themselves down on a rope down to the lower deck. Isabella and Harvey make it, but as Anne Annis is coming down here, one of the guys from above will jump and knock into her and actually knock her back onto the deck. Her husband and daughter are in the water. She is on the deck. She eventually jumps into the water herself, but it turns out that her life belt had been knocked askew by the guy that bumped into her. So she swims over to the rudder. She's holding on to the rudder, fixing her life belt, and she sees her husband and daughter struggling through this crowd. They eventually will get onto a, a, a door, uh, uh, the door that has been blown off the boat, but they are never seen again. Some people say they think they spotted them in a, a, an eddy, a little whirlpool down in the river. And they think that Isabella got swept off and Harvey let go of the door to try to save his daughter. And the two of them died. But, but both of them, are, their bodies are never found. And Annis is one of two civilian females that will survive the Sultana. Now, as the boat is burning, another boat coming down river sees them. It is the Bostona the Bostonian number two, the second boat named the Bostona. They come down river and they see this, this flame burning in the distance. They have no idea what it is until they get closer and, and say, oh my gosh, it's a steamboat. And those are men jumping into the river. We thought it was a bunch of cattle jumping into the river. Well, they, they do tear off all their shutters, their doors, their stage planks and stuff like that and shove them into the water for people to try to save themselves with. They will rescue about 250 men. And then the captain of the Boston, a man named John Watson, makes the difficult decision of leaving the Sultana and rushing down river to Memphis to try to tell uh, the city of Memphis that, hey guys, seven miles up river, we've got a, a major disaster happening. What he didn't know was that one of the soldiers had already floated down river and had been rescued, pulled out of the floodwaters. And when somebody said, was your farm overflowed and did you get you know, uh, pushed along by the floodwaters? He said, no, I was a soldier on the Sultana. The, the Sultana blew up and it's now on fire. Well, it takes some time for these steamboats docked at Memphis to build up the pressure in their boilers. So in the meantime, they start sending out their small boats, their yawls, their rowboats to try to rescue all these people that are now floating all the way down to, uh, to Memphis. In the meantime, up at the Sultana, that paddle wheel housing that had tilted outward finally burns all the way through and will fall over into the water, but it does not fall away from the boat. So what happens now is it acts like a giant outrigger canoe, like you've seen in Hawaii. The water comes along, hits this paddle wheel, which is sticking out, and it starts to spin the boat. So all the, the wind is still coming from the front, but now as the boat starts to turn, 
the back becomes the front, the front becomes the back, and all of those guys that had sought refuge on the bow now have to get off because the boat has turned completely around before the second paddle wheel falls over and basically stabilizes it with its, with its bow downriver. So now the flames still being blown from, we'll say north to south, are going to be blown towards the bow. And the second group of men will jump into the river. The problem is any slight pieces of wood, uh, uh, shutters were taken by the first group. The second group have nothing. So there is a second mad rush fight in the water. And this is where literally dozens and dozens of people go down at the same time. Now, there was one man in the water that actually got blown off of the boat. He was John H. Simpson from the 3rd Tennessee Cavalry, only 17 years old. He got blown off to the boat, and he said, you know, I, I was floating along, and I could see the fight in the water, and I could see the boat burning, but that didn't bother me. What bothered me was where was that darn alligator? Well, he didn't really have to worry about the alligator because another man, William Luganbill at 135th Ohio, also remembered that alligator. But more than that, he remembered that sturdy wooden crate that that alligator was in. So he got himself a bayonet, perhaps from one of the guards or something. He, he stabbed the alligator, dumped it onto the deck, and took that sturdy wooden crate and threw it into the water and used it as his own little rowboat to get down to Memphis. Now, people have said, is that a real story or is that just a, a, a good story that somebody's telling? Well, we didn't know for sure until years later um, I was able to purchase at a Civil War show a curio box owned by William Luganbill that he would keep rings and his watch and things like that and change, pocket change. And on this box, it says, William Luganbill, saved by an alligator. And in fact, he had this little ivory scrimshaw piece made up out of a, uh, an ivory tooth carved into the shape of an alligator. We even, years after that, were able to find a cane that belonged to William Luganbill, which is marked on one side, William Luganbill, on the other side, 135th Ohio, on the other side, an Andersonville survivor, and it says, saved by an alligator. So yes, people, that's not a fallacy story. That is one of the true stories of the Sultana. Now the Sultana will blow up, as I said, up here as it came across the river and, the, and it started to straighten out, when those boilers went back to an even keel, that's when they explode. But the Sultana will drift down river and eventually end up right here. You can see it says Sultana, right at the head of Hen Island. Uh, it floats into the top of overflowed trees. The, the river was, <coughs> excuse me, at such a, such a flood stage that um, what happened was um, the, the only thing that could be seen above the water was the tops of trees. Some of the men that have floated in the tops of these trees figure, oh, I'm safe now. But when they reach down, there's no land underneath them. It's just the rest of the tree trunk. So they're, they're forced to sit in these trees and wait for rescue boats to come and get them. Well, the Sultana will be tied off up here. And, and what happens is eventually some uh, uh, people from Mound City put together a little raft and will go out and rescue about 30 guys that have climbed back up on board the Sultana once the major fires have, have dissipated. Uh, the Sultana is still burning, but not so much on the bow where these guys have collected. Uh, these citizens from Mound City will rescue them, take them back you know, to, the, to dry land, and they get the last man off the boat when the Sultana supposedly gave a shudder and sank beneath the waves of the Mississippi River. Uh, so here's my, I'm showing it blew up up there and it sank down there. Now in the morning when the sun comes up, uh, again, the explosion ha happens about two o'clock by about six o'clock in the morning as the sun is coming up, uh, the, the river front in front of Memphis is literally dotted with, with, uh, human beings. Uh, these rowboats have started to go out. And in fact, finally, some of the steamboats have got the pressure up in their boilers and they start going up river grabbing people off of the tops of overflowed uh, buildings. They've been sitting on the roofs of these overflowed buildings or from the treetops. Well, some of the people uh, are, will, will be brought down to Memphis, including uh, the dead. And uh, what they do is there are the, uh, uh, the injured and wounded and the survivors are put on 
wagons and, and hacks and sent up river to five or sent into the city to five different uh, hospitals. The bodies themselves are collected and placed along the, the wharf. Eventually, Memphis runs out of coffins. They don't have enough coffins in the city. And they are just putting the people on the wharf and covering them with blankets. Um, friends, neighbors, relatives, uh, soldiers that in, instead of being brought directly to a hospital, they start walking along the line looking to see if they can recognize any of their friends or a brother or a father or, or anybody like that. Um, so uh, these bodies are collected along the wharf, but the survivors are sent to the hospitals. Um, some of the men, however, float past the city and end up down here and they thought, wow, when I pass the city, I'm in big trouble. But as they're going down river, what's happening is some of these rowboats are coming down river to save them. And they get opposite a place called Fort Pickering. Fort Pickering was actually garrisoned by some United States colored troops who had been ordered to shoot at any unidentified rowboat that you see in the river because it might be Confederate guerrillas. So as these guys, these rowboats are floating down here and plucking uh, Sultana survivors out of the water, the guards along Fort Pickering start shooting at them. But eventually one of the rowboats will come over and say, stop shooting at us. There's been a disaster and we're saving these guys from the Sultana. And then the guards at Fort Pickering put down their guns, build some fires, get some coffee going, and they start helping out with the rescue. Uh, what happened to Major William Fiddler, the, the officer in charge, uh, the ranking officer in charge of the prisoners? He will lose his life on the Sultana and his body is never found. Uh, he was on the upper decks. He came down to the lower decks to try to put the fire out when they could not find the, uh, the fire buckets. He stays on board trying to help people. And he's, he's on the bow when he hears a cry of a lady saying that her mother is drowning. Uh, William Fiddler will jump overboard to try to save the drowning mother, and he is also grabbed by some of these drowning soldiers, and he goes down with them. The other person that never survives is Captain James Cass Mason. He lives through the explosion. He is seen at various parts of the boat ripping off shutters and doors and pieces of wood and throwing them overboard, but he is never seen to leave the Sultana, and his body is never found. He, he died, but his, both of these guys, their bodies are never recovered. Now, what was the amount of people that died on the Sultana? Out of the 2,136 people on the Sultana, at least 1,169 died. You may have heard stories of 1,500 died, 1,700 died, 1,800. Well, I heard the same stories and, and I retired in 2015 and I said, where's this gonna end? The numbers keep going up and up and up. In fact, there is even a website out there that says 2000 people died. Well, there, there wasn't that many people on board the Sultana uh, to have that many die and that many survivors. And we know that there was uh, about 930 survivors. So I finally sat down and went through all the known records, the hospital records, uh, everything, and I determined there was 1,169 people that died, but we usually say 1,200 because I may have missed a handful. The Sultana uh, will, uh, right after the disaster, it hits all the major headlines in, in the newspapers, in New York, in Boston, Philadelphia, in Chicago, Cincinnati, St. Louis, a lot of the major river uh, uh, towns. However, what happened is after it is discovered that these soldiers were from Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Tennessee, uh, Kentucky, and a little from West Virginia, uh, the big Eastern papers, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, decide, hey, we've got more important things to cover. We're covering Abraham Lincoln's funeral train going across the whole United States down to Springfield, Illinois. We're covering the search for uh, John Wilkes Booth, which will actually be shot the day before. And then his, his body will be brought back to Washington, DC on the day that the Sultana blows up on April 27th. You have the surrender of Joe Johnson's army down in North Carolina. You have a search for Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. There's so much news happening that the Sultana is pushed 
to the back pages of the newspaper. In fact, this woodcut will appear in Harper's Weekly in May of 1865, a couple of weeks after the disaster. However, they do not include a story of the Sultana. They just have this woodcut. If you missed the story from a couple of weeks earlier, you might have looked at this and said, nice drawing, but what is it? So they do not include uh, a little story telling you what you're seeing right here. Now, only one man will be placed, uh, 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 arrested and charged with court martial uh, for, for the overloading of the Sultana. And that man is Captain Frederick Speed, who really was, the, was out at that parole camp, putting the men on board those three trains and sending them into Vicksburg. He never saw the Sultana until very late in the afternoon when two of the train loads had already been placed on board. Um, he never put a single person on board the Sultana, yet he is the man that they go after. Now, the military wants to go after Reuben Hatch, but Reuben Hatch, right after the Sultana explodes, decides to quit the service. He knew when it was time to get out. He quit the service and he went back to his farm uh, in Griggsville, Illinois, which is near Springfield. Um, during the uh, speed uh, trial, they will subpoena Reuben Hatch three times to try to get him to come to Vicksburg. And had he come to Vicksburg, I think the evidence would have showed that he was the man responsible for the over for selecting the Sultana and for for cutting a deal with James Cass Mason and for overloading it. And he probably would have been arrested and put on trial. Um, so he ignores the three subpoenas. Eventually, the judge advocate will take and, and write out a, what was called a writ of attachment against Hatch. The writ of attachment literally will send a, uh, a U.S. Marshal to your house with handcuffs to attach himself to you and drag your butt down to Vicksburg. But Reuben Hatch goes into hiding and the U.S. Marshal cannot find him. Well, the trial goes on and Frederick Speed is found guilty for overloading the Sultana, even though he never put a single person on board. Eventually what happens is the transcripts of the trial go to Judge Advocate Holt in Washington. He looks at him and says, you have the wrong man. He takes and he uh, releases Speed and says, no, let's give him an honorable discharge. The man we should be going after is Reuben Hatch. But again, Reuben Hatch will not serve a single day of a court martial and gets away with it. Nobody was ever found guilty or, or put on trial again for the overcrowding of the Sultana. Now, if the Sultana was ranked, the Union officers that died on the Sultana, if you rank it against some of the bigger battles of the Civil War, the Sultana would rank number 12. Of course, these other battles such as Gettysburg and Wilderness and Cold Harbor, these were multiple day battles. Uh, the exception, of course, is Antietam battle, but the multiple day battles had more deaths than on the Sultana. Yet the Union guys that died on the Sultana all died within about five hours. So it was a terrible disaster. And it ranks higher than Spotsylvania, First Bull Run, the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee. So more Union soldiers will die on the Sultana uh, than some of these bigger, well-known battles in the Civil War. If you take and compare the Sultana to the Titanic, which is like, which is what happened uh, uh, when the Sultana uh, when the Titanic sank in 1912, people people would look and say, "Wow, look at the Titanic, 882 feet long. The Sultana only 260 feet long. Yet they both had roughly the same amount of people on board. So if you don't think the Sultana was crowded, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you." You take all the people on board the, the Titanic and load them on board the Sultana. The, the Titanic had 1,517 people die. The Sultana had 1,169. A death rate on the Titanic of 68, the Sultana of 55%. Almost the same amount of people on the Titanic as was on the Sultana. That's incredible to think of. Uh, the, now, everybody remembers the Arizona and everybody remembers Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor had 1,177 sailors and Marines die on it when it was attacked by the Japanese on December 7, 1941. The Sultana had only about, what, 60, 70 people less soldiers die on the Sultana. 
everybody remembers Arizona and the attack on Pearl Harbor, yet very few people remember the Sultana, and they should. Um, we now have in Marion, Arkansas, we have a temporary interim museum. It's across the river from Memphis. It's close to the spot where the Sultana lies buried. The Sultana actually sank in the Mississippi River. Over the years, it was covered over with silt every time you had a flood. Eventually, it was completely buried. When the, when the Mississippi River changed courses and moved to the east, the Sultana is now about three miles inland under an Arkansas bean field. Inside our museum, we have a 14-foot model of the Sultana, and we, of course, have the, the famous uh, curio box from our, al our alligator killer, uh, William Luganbeal. Um, that about ends my presentation. These are the other books I've written. Uh, and Charles, I don't know if you want to come back on board and open it up to uh, discussion. And again, I really apologize for the telephone. I got, I got it off the hook. And so we're not going to get another phone call, but I'm sorry for that. I apologize. Don't, do not apologize at all. Seriously, it happens. Um, I have a toddler that likes to run around and I'm giving presentations. <laughs> <laughs> he there is you my go. telephone. There you go. <laughs> um, there, there you go. Yes. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to use that Q&A uh, section down at the bottom. Um, we'll get those answered. But um I guess uh, sure, while we sure. wait for, for questions to roll in, um, what, if I may ask, what uh, led you to really getting into learning more and researching the Sultana? Um, I actually ran across the Sultana by accident. I, I was born and raised in the Chicago area, uh, but in uh, uh, my parents eventually moved. I graduated high school. I was going to college here. And my parents, because of my dad's job, moved about 90 miles away. And once I had finished my year at, at, uh, at the university for the summer, I moved down by my parents and got a temporary job. And I would go to the, to the library in that small town. And, and I was reading all the books I could about the Civil War because I really loved the Civil War. And I ended up reading a book called Transport to Disaster which came out in 1962. It was actually published by a fellow whose grandfather had been on board the boat. And that's how he, well, I read book Transport to Disaster and I was amazed. I have read all these books about the Sultana or about the Civil War and never heard a thing about the Sultana. But the problem was this guy's books had no, I wanted more. I wanted to learn more, but he had no footnotes. And I was like, oh my God, where did you get this information? And that set me on my path of learning more and more about the Sultana. And I just, uh, I fell in love with it. You know, it's, uh, again, it's a story that needs to be told. Not enough people know about it. it you know, it happened, if you think about the, where the location of Memphis, that's smack dab in the middle of the United States. Mm -hmm. And yet here's a, here's a major, uh, the worst marriage, Maritime disaster in American history, right smack dab in the middle of the United States, and nobody's heard of it. And so that's why I thought, you know, I need to work on this and eventually write a book. When my book came out in '96, it's now republished. You showed a, an original copy, a hardbound yeah. copy, and it's now <laughs> it's now reprinted. There, there you go. It's now reprinted with the with the orange cover. It is a, a yeah. soft soft cover, but it is available. Um, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, I was telling. Uh, Charles, before that, I, I, uh, in the 25 years since my book came out in 96, I have continued to research. And I just recently uh, signed a contract with the same publisher, the Naval Institute Press from Annapolis, Maryland. And I will have another, a new book on the Sultana coming out in March or April of next year, 2022. And it will have about 80% new material uh, from, uh, from my book my first book that's awesome so that's how i got involved in the sultana and it's it's become my passion or my obsession ever since yeah um <laughs> i actually uh really got your information from uh i received a letter at the museum from uh, i think it was from the survivors uh, uh what's it called association uh, yeah thank you association yep. and uh 
um, they were basically saying, hey, we just want to, you know, start to, uh, to spread the word about Sultana. And um, there's one person in particular that you need to talk to. And I'm like, well, I, I, I know who this guy is. I've never talked to you, obviously. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that it's go. so it's it's uh, it is definitely a story that deserves to be told. And um, and I I thank you so much for um, for coming on today and and. and and talking all about it but um, we did get a comment um from sarah okay. who, uh, sarah goodman is a colleague of mine she works at drakewell museum um in in, in pennsylvania titusville and uh, she said uh the same type of boilers were used in the oil industry uh here in in pennsylvania and were notorious for explosions during this time period so um yeah just uh, one yes. comment <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, very good very good yeah. no no that she's right and and the the type of boiler that was used on the Sultana was called a uh, uh, a tubular boiler, where a normal boiler was called a flue boiler. And a flue boiler had like three of those big, and they were pretty big, three big tubes going through it, uh, which which let the the hot air go through and it turned you know boil the water. On the Sultana, they had experimented with something called tubular boilers, which had uh, uh, like two dozen smaller tubes running through it. The only mm -hmm. problem it was very hard to clean because they used uh, the water inside the boilers was Mississippi muddy river water, and the mud, the sediment, ended up collecting in the body bottom of these boilers, and it was hard to get in there and clean because of all these little oh. tubes running through. Um, nice. And and also they found out that uh, recently we found out that the that the metal that was used was called charcoal uh, uh, number uh, number one. Uh, hammered number one, and it was a very bad type of metal because it it does not uh, it intends crack, and it does not uh, it's not malleable, it's not bendable, oh. and and it tends to get brittle when you heat it and cool it and heat it and cool it. Well, that's exactly what they did on a steamboat. They would dock on a in a port for three or four days, and the boilers would cool down, and then they'd heat them up again, go down river and back up river, sit in port and cool them down. And so uh, once that the Sultana exploded, there's going to be two more uh, steamboats with the same type of tubular boiler that will explode. And then after that, uh, they are basically pulled. All the uh, It's interesting, in my second book, I, I point out that uh, steamboats were advertising that I, we don't have tubular boilers. We don't <laughs> have them anymore. We pulled them. We took them off. So, I mean, they got to be in as these boilers were used in factories also on land. And uh, again, you know, you, you, you close down on a Sunday because they usually work, you know, Monday through Saturday in those days, but it cools down and then they heat it back up again. And, and sure enough, the boilers were exploding in these factories too. And they ended up taking the tubular boilers out of those factories. So yeah. good point. Sarah's right on, right on spot. Oh yeah. Um, do we, I guess it's a question for you. Do you, do we know much about the people who, um, worked in those boiler rooms. Um, is there much information about the who they were? We we do not. We do not. Other than the the two engineers, we don't know any of the names of what they call the firemen, the guys, the stokers, yeah. or the firemen that would toss the uh, uh, the coal in. Uh, we don't have any of their names. In fact, it's interesting. At our Sultana Museum, uh, we do have a paycheck to a man that was a, a deckhand on one of the boats. And it's 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 like $2.40. He worked a whole trip from St. Louis down to New Orleans and he was paid like $2.40. And all it says is like John. Doesn't even have a last name. Wow. It just says, here's a check to John. So chances are they didn't they didn't even know half these guys' last names. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know they they switched from boats to boats, you know, whichever one might be or that their buddies might be on or might be paying a couple cents more per trip. Um, so no, we know the the two engineers, the that guy Nathan Wintringer, he survived, uh, but his partner, uh, a man named Samuel Clemens, not to be confused with uh, Mark Twain, Samuel yeah. Clemens, he was mortally scalded when the boilers exploded. He he mm -hmm. does survive long enough to give a dying statement saying there was enough pressure water in the boilers and the pressure was just perfect. Well, I I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, uh, but he ended up dying. So those oh, are the geez. only two people that we know uh, connected with the boilers and the engines and such. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, 
Sure. I just, sure. I, I think that's that those are all the questions we had um, on Facebook. But um, if people do have questions after the fact, um, I, I, my contact info, I'll actually put that down here um, and uh, we can try to get those answered for everybody. But um, sure. Gene, thank sure. you. Thank you so much. I, I absolutely love this. The, the alligator piece. I had no idea. <laughs> that is a really <laughs> cool artifact. And yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much. for it, sharing. It, it is. It is. Well, yeah. it, it proved the point that, yes, you know, he had told his story. Yeah. And a uh, couple of couple of my colleagues were like, I, ah, you know, is he just, you know, is this old wives tale or what? Yeah. But when I was able to, to find that that the curio oh. box and purchase it and then and then a few years later, his cane, that was even that was that was icing on the cake at that. Point. Yeah. So yeah. very, very cool. Very, very cool. cool. That, I think that's yep. one of my favorite uh, favorite artifacts out of this story. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So um, you thank go. you, everybody, you for go. tuning in. Gene, thank you. Um, it was sure. an absolute pleasure. And again, to, I apologize for the for the interruptions with the phone call. I have to put my <laughs> phone back on the hook. So, <laughs> Don't apologize. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Have a great okay. Saturday. Take care. Thank you, Charles. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everybody.